thank Father John Tregilio, Dr. David Anders, and Colin Donovan for being with us today. And thank you for joining us. Don't forget to join us next week with host Ryan Penny here on The Catholic Sphere. I'm Doug Keck. Thanks for joining us. Listener-supported Iowa Catholic Radio, 1150 AM KWKY, Des Moines, 94.5 FM K233BT, Des Moines, 88.5 FM KIHS, Adel, online anytime at iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We're coming to you from these United States of America, here in the middle of the country, good old Iowa, where we are on Iowa Catholic Radio. <laughs> uh, underwritten, uh, this is The Uncommon Good, unwritten, bo- un- unwritten, underwritten, by Mercy College of Health Sciences, where I am uh, the Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives and the Director for the Center for Human Flourishing. But what do you do at MCHS? I am the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I feel like I have to enunciate carefully each syllable because there's a lot of consonants in that title. <laughs> dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So that's, yeah, but when he gets in Dean mode, he speaks like that. Otherwise, it just sounds like Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I would, I would love it if you were up there at meetings just over enunciating and make everybody's eyes and ears bleed because they can't take it. Look, that's not what happens, folks. You want to go to Mercy College because people are not tripped up by things like over enunciating. Instead, Mercy College does cool things like underwrite our show, but also gets you prepared to be a part of the healing ministry of the Sisters of Mercy. Ever since uh, Mother Catherine McCauley started doing so in Dublin in the 19th century, carrying on their torch to bring that healing to communities that need it, mchs.edu. Well, you're the king of segues, and I'm always kind of jealous and feel a little insecure about my own segue abilities, but I got a good one <laughs> all right, today. Let's hear it. So Mercy College of Health Sciences not only provides all those wonderful academic offerings that you're talking about, but our guest on the show today is in part on the show because of an initiative at Mercy College of Health Sciences. So you're, I can't remember your title, but you're also the director of the Center for Human Flourishing. That's right. Part of your role there. And uh, Angel Parham, our guest this morning is, or today I should say, uh, with the different broadcast times, uh, is, is, is a fellow of the Institute. Absolutely. So Angel Adams Parham is Associate Professor of Sociology, Sociology and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia. She writes on sociology and all sorts of fantastic stuff, but she's been our fellow. Uh, she started last year. She's actually going to be in Des Moines this coming up uh, in fall, so it's going to be great to have her. But she's really been concentrating, Bud, on the idea of memory and health and how it is that people imagine um Uh, They have a cultural imagination that allows them to have healing memories. And she thinks that this has a lot to do with uh, the ability to, I would say, engage with what we'd call the liberal arts. And so she's worked with our students, having them read liberal arts uh, stories, humanities stories, and try to relate that to um, their practice um, in nursing. It's been great to be a part of her work doing that. I'm glad she's going to be on the show talking about it today. So we will be back shortly after this with our a- interview with Angel. Stick around. This is the Uncommon Good, and we're glad to have you with us. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by CTO. What great news for donors to the Catholic Tuition Organization. You now receive 75% of your donation back in Iowa tax credits. Your support has helped thousands of students attend our Catholic schools. Best gift ever. Online, ctoiowa.org. At CTO, the bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. 
Does your financial portfolio benefit from abortion, contraception, human cloning, or embryonic stem cell research? Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors offers investment products that are Catholic screened and designed for faith-based investors. Contact an advisor at 844-493-4010 or visit kfcassetadvisors.org to learn more about how you can seek to align your faith and finances. Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors is an SCC registered investment advisor. Investment products are not guaranteed and may lose value. Thank you, Advisor Gregory Waddle, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference July 27th through the 29th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dale Alquist, Bishop Robert Barron, Christopher Check, and an all-star lineup of speakers celebrate the 100th anniversary of Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi. Three days of intellectual stimulation, spiritual edification, fellowship, and fun. Learn more about the conference and register at Chesterton.org. Chesterton.org. A message from the Society of G.K. Chesterton and Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences, where you can chart your course for more. Mercy College provides unparalleled clinical rotations, hands-on learning, accelerated education, and flexible schedules. Since 1899, Mercy College has been transforming students into healthcare professionals. Guided by Catholic values, our faculty put classroom theory into practice. Students are prepared for roles in service and leadership throughout their own careers. Learn more at mchs.edu. Mercy College of Health Sciences. mchs.edu. We're back with The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Budmar joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. It's wonderful to have you here as a guest. Speaking of guests, today we're interviewing Dr. Angel Adam Par- Adams Parham, excuse me, uh, who is the 2022-2023 Research Fellow for the Center for Human Flourishing here at Mercy College. One of the nice things about how uh, sometimes schedules work is, Bud, technically she's the 22-2023 Research Fellow. Usually that means that we have them for fall in the spring, but because of uh, how things are going to work out, um, Angel has been working with us since the fall 2022, but she's actually going to be here in Des Moines in spring, September 14th and 15th, 2023. People need to be on the lookout at mchs.edu slash flourish. And also, of course, on our show, we'll make sure to advertise that. Um, but she's uh, she's interacted with our students, uh, and we'll talk about that on the show, but just in general, she's the assist, Associate Provost of so, uh, Sociology and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Uh, her work, she works in areas of historical sociology, engaging in research and writing that examine the past in order to better understand how to live well in the present and envision wisely for the future. She's written many wonderful articles and books. One of the most recent books that I think people may know her from in the Twitter world because uh, she's had the chance to talk about it. A co-authored book, uh, The Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature. And uh, her public facing work has also led her to become the co-founder and executive director of the uh, uh, Nianza, I always mess that up, she'll cor- uh, correct me, Classical Community. Angel, thank you for joining us uh, on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here, both. Thank you so much for the invitation. So we, of course, have had the chance to talk to each other uh, over the years. It's wonderful how Providence runs, uh, makes wonderful people run into each other. I guess I just call myself wonderful. You're certainly wonderful. I feel blessed to have ran ran, ran into you multiple times. Um, The work that you've done, um, I think, has led for a natural fit for what we do here. You know, the Center for Human Flourishing at Mercy College of Health Sciences, really trying to find the intersection of what we're, you know, practical wisdom. How is it that the research we do helps affect um, practice on the ground? So it's not just technical research, but how is it that uh, reimagining the way people live in the world can help us live in a more flourishing way? And so one of the things when I thought of a perfect person to talk about this, this overlapping and intersection of many different fields, I thought of you. But I want to make sure people know how it is that the work you do um, fits in with human flourishing itself. So if you don't mind, can you tell us what you do in general and how that led to the partnership that we're hoping to do here with uh, the Center for Human Flourishing at Mercy College? Sure. Yeah, so I, I think I could really say that this, the, the whole idea of human flourishing has completely taken over my life work. <laughs> in various ways. <laughs> um, you know, so I have had the privilege of being able to start to read really, really deeply, probably starting about 10 years ago, um, 
getting a classical education, reading classic literature, you know, philosophy. Aristotle is one of my favorites, um, who I'm, you know, I'm sure is one of your favorites too. And woo woo. The- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Team Aristotle. <laughs> Right. (laughs) In terms of this whole idea of human flourishing, um, you know, which he addresses very much in the Nicomachean Ethics, um, you know, as I have gotten more and more into this body of work and have, you made reference to my book, um, The Black Intellectual Tradition, so the the title may not convey so much, you know, I, I guess the subtitle does, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature, but it is a book about how um, so many black intellectuals have been formed in classic literature, um, certainly during the 18th and the 19th century, less often in the 20th and beyond. But some of our most towering intellectuals were really formed by reading deeply this classic literature. And what's important about that literature, um, sometimes people dismiss it, oh, you know, it's just kind of about being elitist or exclusive. And that's really not at all the point. What's so compelling about that tradition is its focus on the great human question. Um, what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be happy? Um, and happy is a, a term that doesn't resonate or doesn't kind of, um, we don't really understand it the way the ancients would have. Um, what we, the, the word happy would have been, it's probably better translated as human flourishing. But, you know, what does it mean to lead a flourishing life or a happy life? What is justice? What is a good society? These great questions um, are the kinds of questions that so many classic authors and um, authors who have who have really stood the test of time. Um, I'm thinking of Dante, for example, another one of my very, very favorites, um, who just wrestled with these deep questions of human existence and the good life, you know, there's, there's nothing like contemplating the good life um, than no, nothing like the, the stakes of contemplating the good life um, than going on a tour through hell. <laughs> 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 what, <laughs> what your life might be if you don't figure out what it means to, to lead a good life. Um, you know, so reading and wrestling with those issues, it, it really fundamentally transformed the way I do my work in sociology. Um, so. I'm an unusual sociologist, I say to say the least. Um, not so many sociologists are, you know, kind of reading and contemplating Aristotle and Plato and thinking about these questions of what is the, the good life and so on. But the more I got into this literature and wrestled with these questions, the more I came back to my sociological work and, you know, for instance, um, teaching a class like social problems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or inequality. So we're trained to kind of gather data and to kind of measure outcomes and to report on social inequalities and problems and maybe try to find solutions. But it struck me that amidst all of that, and I majored in sociology, you know, starting um, basically at the age of 19, and I've never left sociology since then. It's been a very long time. But it really struck me the the incongruity of spending so much time looking at inequalities and social problems and never asking the question of what is a good society? What is a good life? And so that really started to work on me. And I I began to really transform the way I think about the work that I do, um, the way that I teach, um, the way that I propose questions to my students and kind of building a bridge from this older tradition to the more contemporary work. Um, so, so yes, and, and, and then you, you also made mention of Neon South Classical Community, which is the, the educational nonprofit that um, is focused on K-12 students. And so they're also, I'm really interested in, in bringing this, this tradition and, and inviting students to these great questions and beautiful texts. And Nyan Sa works specifically, is very, very interested in less advantaged students who are often not getting that kind of rich conversation. Oh, well, thank you for setting the, the, the scene for what you're up to. And, and you're right about you being an unusual sociologist. And that, to me, that's high <laughs> praise because my argument 
as a philosophy dork is when sociologists get unusual, they have some of the best work possible. One of my favorite authors is Mary Douglas, for instance, and from like purity and danger uh, to Mm -hmm. like what is risk. You know, I, I actually see a lot of overlap about how your work and her work, not like the same content, but that the questions about what's important um, just became so mm-hmm. pressing um, that, you know, the sort of work typical at the time that both of you are writing. And of course, those are two different eras, of course, but willingness to step out to ask really unique questions, I would say comparatively to the rest of the field. And I got to see that in action, Angel, when I got to be a part of the Zoom meetings you had with some of our students reading short works of literature that had to do with um, medicine and how people remember, as it were, the medical experience. So if you don't mind talking about that a little bit, too, and I hope that you take my comparison of you to Mary, uh, uh, with Mary Douglas's high praise. She's one of my favorite authors as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so when we first began talking about those, um, this research fellowship, I said that um, I saw that the greatest connection between the work that you all are doing and what I'm doing in terms of the themes of memory and the imagination. Um, and so I'll start with imagination, the importance of particularly the moral imagination and um, the, the, the importance of cultivating the moral imagination transcends the field. Uh, so there, there are a couple of ways of thinking about it and several authors who have a focus on it. Uh, philosopher John Keeks Things in terms of um, the moral imagination is forming pictures of the, the good life and coming to resemble them. So forming forming pictures of what would be a good way, a flourishing way to live in the world, and then striving to become like that. The vegan Goroyan, um, in his book, um, Tending the Heart of Virtue, which is aimed toward the importance of children's stories and fairy tales, says, that a good moral education addresses both the cognitive and the affective dimensions of human nature, and stories are an irreplaceable medium for that kind of moral education. Uh, Because what happens then is that you put yourself into the place of the protagonist. Are you going to be brave enough to slay the dragon? You know, what are you going to do um, when you find yourself, um, you know, in say, the story of Snow White, are you going to be like the wicked stepmother or like the virtuous Snow White? You have to kind of make these decisions, you know, even in the heart of the story. So literature has this wonderful way of, of bringing us into the center of um, moral issues and what it means to be human. When you are dealing with a discipline like sociology or when you're in the medical field, there can be a tendency to kind of just focus on the, you know, the facts. And of course, we do want you to focus on the facts. You know, I want my surgeon to focus on the facts um, (laughs) when they're working on me. Absolutely. Um, So there's nothing wrong with focusing on the facts. But there is a way in which um, it's important, especially when we're working um, in a field where we're dealing with humans who are hurting in some way, whether physically, or dealing with um, psychological challenges, it's not always sufficient to just take down the facts. In fact, if you only take down the facts um, on a very surface level, you may miss something that's really at the essence of what is important for helping and healing the person in front of you. And so literature can help us to kind of get into some of those issues. So the first story that we read is... um, a short story by Anton Chekhov called The Black Monk. And it's a, it's a really, I love, I love Russian literature. Um, talk about folks who have suffered. Um, it just really comes out in the literature. It's a very philosophical and rich literature, and this story is very rich and philosophical. And it, it starts out with um, a man named Kovrin at the beginning of the story, he seems to be suffering from some kind of breakdown. And it says on the first page that he, um, you know, he's, he's wondering about whether or not he should seek treatment. Um, and he consults someone and they say, you know, why don't you just kind of go into, go to the countryside, you know, kind of take a break. Um, he seemed to be dealing with 
of being worn out and unsettled nerves. Um, and it's, it raises these questions. At the deeper you get into the story, it, it raises these questions about the intersection of social, physical, psychological, and even potentially spiritual sources of illness and well-being. And so we talk about this, and, you know, as you get into the story, this black monk appears. I don't want to spoil everything for those mm -hmm. who might want to go and read it. But this black monk appears, and suffice it to say, um, Kareem starts to have a hard time discerning reality. Um, and, you know, he, he's kind of, it seems like at the edges of the real in terms of his perception of what is happening. And the black monk is not experienced by everyone other than Code Green. But at a certain point, when um, his wife figures out what's going on, she takes him and admits him to the hospital, right? Which, you know, seems reasonable. Um, but something, something happens um, when he's getting this treatment, you know, what, whatever the treatment is, that when he comes out of it, um, he doesn't seem to see the black monk, but he also seems to have been eviscerated of the core of who he is um, as a person. Uh, so, the, so the story, you know, it, it really, um, it really asks us to look at this intersection again of the, the physical, the psychological, um, the, the spiritual, and in trying to really tease out what what does it mean to be um, whole? What? How do you heal when there's all of these different um, aspects that are working together? You know, so often, um, you, you know, it. I, I don't want to go into you know all of my own details of, of going to the doctor, but there can be a kind of um, aseptic um, interaction. So we, we want things to be aseptic in terms of the environment, so we don't want germs, but that can sometimes seep into the way of interacting, and it, it can make it so that it's, it's very hard um, to get to the core of what the situation is um, if you're going to only stay on the surface level. Really fascinating work, Angel, and as you were talking uh, my my mind went to some of my own work with St. John Henry Newman. And Newman, yeah, he wrote a bit on the university and how the different fields, like the different fields of study at an institution of higher ed, like how they, they, they should form an entire community that's investigating all of reality. And just, just hearing you speak about some of the literature that you tackle, I'm wondering if you could talk to what it's like teaching that at the University of Virginia, sort of like against the landscape of what else is going on at the university. Or like another way to come at this question is like, as your students come to you, given like their diverse areas of study, you know, are there, are there sort of like obstacles, um, so to speak, for them entering into these conversations? I'm sure it takes a kind of almost like mental training to get to some of the discussions you want to have. Sure. Um, so what I would say is, you know, I, it, certainly there are lots of differences, you know, too many to count, between um, the, the medical profession and the social sciences. But, again, one of the things that I think is the continuity um, it is this idea that, you know, you're going to focus on the facts, um, on, a, a, you know, clearly defined objectives and assessments, and you're going to learn the scientific or the social scientific literature, and you're just going to go on from there. And I do all of that, you know, I, I teach the social science, you know, but I also introduce key questions that I think can be introduced um, also in medicine. And, I, you know, I think the whole field of medical humanities um, bears this out as well. But I introduce the question in my, um, so I teach social theory. We're looking at mainly 18th and 19th century social theorists. And the Standard themes, the standard approach would be to think about the transition from tradition to modernity, um, you know, the, the individual and society and how they interact and influence each other. And so I, I do all of that standard. But I also introduce the question for each author that we read, what is their understanding of human flourishing? 
Um, and indeed, they do have an understanding of human flourishing, whether they spell it out or not. Um, and I think this is true across professions and areas of, of in, in different disciplines, that there is um, always some kind of, um, it may be inchoate, it may be implicit understanding of human flourishing in the, the people that we are reading, right? There, there's a, there's a, an assumption about what it means to be human and what it means to lead a good life, what it means to be um, well and healthy. Um, there are underlying assumptions in the, the mainstream material that we study. And I have found that, you know, I teach the, the, the material the way I'm supposed to teach it, but, I, but just by introducing that one question, it allows me to transform the conversation and invite my students to reach deeper into their thinking about what the author is saying, what their assumptions are about human beings and human societies and a good life, and at least them ask questions themselves about their own life. And so um, I, I think that it's possible for just about anyone um, in any field to introduce that question and think about what kinds of assumptions is my field making about human flourishing? Um, and it does help, I think, when the instructor is inviting students to ask that question, you know, very gently um, with the material that we already have. So I, I think I think it does require um, some some careful tending to have those conversations. But I think it can certainly happen. And I've had um, students come up to me, you know, as I'm guiding some of those discussions, I've, I've had students come and ask me these deep questions about their lives and, um, you know, saying, yeah, I feel like there should be more than just the kind of surface level achievement in my life. And I'm really grappling with, you know, a sense of dissatisfaction and trying to reach deeper. But, um, you know, so much of my training is just geared toward, you know, passing the test and, you know, kind of just like mm -hmm. going along the professional track. And I'm not always asking these deeper questions. So um, I've also had... <laughs> Oh, I'm just going to say, we're, we're heading up on the break. This is fascinating stuff. So let's go ahead and take the break. And when we get back, we'll jump right back into this very salient question. This is the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr will be back right after this. Support for programming is provided by Gregory Waddle from Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors. Is your financial portfolio pro-life? Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors offers investment products designed for faith-based investors. Seek to align your faith and your finances with a portfolio that does not benefit from abortion, contraception, human cloning, or embryonic stem cell research. Visit kofcassetadvisors.org. kofcassetadvisors.org. Knights of Columbus Asset Advisors is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Investment products are not guaranteed and may lose value. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference, July 27th through the 29th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dale Alquist, Bishop Robert Barron, Christopher Check, and an all-star lineup of speakers celebrate the 100th anniversary of Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi. Three days of intellectual stimulation, spiritual edification, fellowship, and fun. Learn more about the conference and register at Chesterton.org. Chesterton.org. A message from the Society of G.K. Chesterton and Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Established in Des Moines in 1924, St. Vincent de Paul assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient by helping to remove roadblocks on their journey out of poverty. St. Vincent de Paul helps with food, clothing, and shelter, while also offering classes in financial literacy, high school completion, career readiness, and prisoner reentry. Shop, donate, volunteer, serve. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul, svdpdsm.org. Support for programming provided by Trappist Caskets, a work of the monks of New Mallory Abbey in Piasta, Iowa. Embracing an honest approach to death can more readily affirm the real meaning of life. Trappist Caskets and urns are made in the prayerful environment of the monastery using Iowa-grown wood from the Abbey's sustainable forest. Each casket and urn is blessed by a monk. Quietly laboring with their hands for 175 years, the monks offer workmanship at the pinnacle of woodworkers' craft. Available for immediate delivery or as a part of a pre-planning program. Learn more at TrappistCaskets.com. 
Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. On the show, we have our guest, Dr. Angel Adams Parham, who is the research fellow for the Center for Human Flourishing, uh, 2022 to 2023. She will be in Des Moines to speak September 14th and 15th of this coming up fall 2023 semester. You will not want to miss that. Um, she is associate professor of sociology and senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced uh, Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia, author of many wonderful uh, books, uh, articles and everything like this. But one book that's come out recently, salient to what we're talking about, the black intellectual tradition, reading freedom in classical literature. It's wonderful. Ever show Angel. Thank you for coming back on the show. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Bo. So. We've been talking about the work you've already done with us so far uh, with the Center for Human Flourishing. You had a chance to meet with our students, read through literature, usually literature that has a sort of angle on um, medicine, of course, because uh, the human sciences uh, students. But this gets to this idea about um, society and memory and, and, and the moral imagination that is dead center in the work that you've been doing in a lot of fields, um, but very helpful in our interaction and, and sort of a preview of what you'll be talking about when you come to Des Moines. Let's keep that rolling. You, we talked about you got to throw some Russian literature uh, at the students, um, but you got to throw some poetry at them as well, if you don't mind bringing that up. Absolutely. Yes. So the poetry is is one of my great loves. <laughs> literature and poetry. I told you I was a very unusual sociologist. Mm -hmm. um, so so we started out by talking about the moral imagination. And I also mentioned that one of the themes is that I've been working on is memory. Um, memory is significant in, in a couple of different ways. Um, in my own work, the, the historical work that I do on race, which is my own area in sociology, um, it's thinking about the memory of our difficult racial past and how do we treat that memory? Do we treat it in a way that we allow it to rip us apart um, or do we treat that memory in a way that allows us to work towards some healing, kind of social healing? Um, so I deal with memory on that level. But there's also the aspect of memory that gets more at um, the crux of the Christian life. And that is, the memory of who we are in Christ and you know, who we are as human beings and, and what it means um, to be a believer. And there, there are several, you know, several things that, that come to mind for me. Um, you know, there's uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Silver Chair, you know, which is all, and I won't ruin the, the, the plot here, but, and, you know, encourage listeners to read it, but it's all about, memory and the importance of remembering who we are and not forgetting who we are. Um, and so the lion Aslan passed the, the children to, you know, when they get to where they're going and they're trying to carry out their mission, they must remember, they must remember who sent them and what their mission is in life. I think it can be very easy for us to lose track of that amid just trying to, you know, get our studies done and climb the professional ladder. What is it all for exactly? So that's one aspect of memory. But then during that meeting that we had on the poetry, I actually started out with some works of art that are in the tradition of memento mori. And memento mori is this idea that remember you have to die. Remember you have to die. And so I started out with the, some paintings um, that portray this idea of memento mori. And then we went into poetry by Emily Dickinson and John Keats on the presence of death in life and how do we live in light of that. And when I tell you that the students had some very profound reflections on that, you know, what does it mean to live in the shadow of death? What does it mean to be a healer in the shadow of death of others? You know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you heal and help in that situation? So um, one of the reasons that I think this is so important, for instance, uh, we're, we're not where you can see visually, but I will commend to the listeners a work of art by um, Giovanni Martinelli called Death Comes to the Banquet. If you look up that painting, Death Comes to the Banquet, you will see um, a rather, you know, 
jarring situation where people are sitting at a banquet and, you know, they're enjoying all of this great food. And then death comes and interrupts. And everyone looks like, is it me? Are you coming for me? Who are you here mm-hmm. for? Um, you know, so this idea of remember that you have to die. Um, I, I also, in choosing Dickinson and Keats, I chose poets who were living at a time when death did stalk every day. Um, you know, it was very common for young people to die, to live with constant illness. Right now, we are blessed to live in a time where so much is at our fingertips in terms of health and healing. You know, antibiotics. Um, we live in a time of antibiotics, right? Um, we have all of these wonderful medications and therapies that help us, and that is a very good thing. But it can also mean that we lose track of the fact that we have to die, and we lose track of directing our lives with that in mind. And then we also can sometimes tip into a situation where we're so focused on not dying um, and, and this, this can sometimes be the case in the health field, that there's so much of a focus on not dying or making sure someone doesn't die that we might overlook what it means to really live and to flourish because we're so focused on not dying. And so that's the reason I wanted to look at that artwork and to grapple with some of this poetry. That's really great. When I was in college and this like brooding young philosopher myself, uh, <laughs> Christopher Nolan, the the filmmaker before Batman fame, he had this movie Memento and it's about a character who like he only had very short term memory, but after a certain period of time, like the memories would go away. And he was trying to, he, he knew he had lost his wife, but he's trying to reconstruct like how his life had played out. So he starts like writing on his body and tattooing his body to restore his memory and the movie i mean in a much better way than i just summarized it it captures how how important it is to have our memories not only as an individual but as a community to be able to live rightly in the world and i feel like angel for many of our students like modern culture has a way of just eviscerating memory where they don't a lot of them don't have rituals that have kind of marked the stages of their lives or shared text, you know, that they, they sort of like can build a community around. And yet, you know, Bo and I have talked about on the show, there's a way that, um, some of the advances and advances in technology are a double edged sword. So we think of smartphones as sort of like, um, ruining people's attention span and things like that. There's also a way where all of that digital technology has created this vast archive. And a lot of young people, especially in the Catholic church, kind of use it to go back and to discover, you know, these, these treasures that weren't immediately at their fingertips, even like a decade ago. I wonder with your students, like, do you, as, as the literature starts to sink in with them and you talk about like, what is human flourishing and then how do we seek true happiness? Or like we could use the term blessedness, like what sort of counsel do you give them or wisdom for like how we, we sort of organize our lives, even if that means like navigating uh, technology or some of the things that might draw us away from from building this kind of rich memory that we're talking about? Great question. Um, so, yeah, there, there are a couple of things that I do with my students on this. Um, one is that I insist on, you know, kind of traditional approaches to reading and memory that are very non-electronic. <laughs> <laughs> that that require that we um, actually handle tangible text and handwrite. Um, so I ask my students um, often to keep a commonplace book. And a commonplace book is a journal, um, but it's a very particular kind of journal where you handwrite um, quotes from the readings that you're doing that stand out to you. And you thematize them. So it could be, you know, this is a, a quote on on death or justice or goodness or mercy, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then once you've filled your journal with these quotes from wonderful readings and you thematize them, you then create an index with the terms and the themes. So you now have an index 
where you have everything that you have read on um, flourishing or everything you've read on death or everything you've read on mercy in that index. And it gives you something to contemplate. Also, when we read, um, often much of what we read doesn't stay with us. You know, we, we may have kind of a general impression or we may remember, you know, a few key things here and there. But when you write it down, when you physically write it down, you are forced, and, and again, I emphasize writing physically because if you type or cut and paste, you're not forced to choose what is the most essential aspect of the text. You have to write it down. You're forced to choose, or your hand is going to fall off writing too much. Um, and it engraves, there is some research to suggest that it really engraves that on your mind and your memory in a way that's very different than if you only underline or write notes in the margin. So I actually go to old, you know, kind of old world technology and say, get your pen and your journal and write down and think deeply and thematize. And that way, when they come out of my class, even if they remember nothing else, they will have that tangible book with quotes, with themes, with reflections, and I do actually check them to make sure that they're doing them and they get credit for that. The other thing that I urge them to do is I, I kind of, um, I, I make them think really hard about their relationship to social media and think really carefully about what kind of life they are cultivating as individuals and we are cultivating as a society when we rely on it. So for instance, there is something completely foreign to me, but what younger generations seem to do more and more, which is that they thoroughly check the social media of a person before deciding whether or not to invest in them as a potential friend. Is it worth my while getting to know you? Well, let me check your social media first. Um, and you know, when I point out that this can have a really devastating effect in terms of meaning, you know, keeping us more and more separated into different kinds of silos, they kind of sheepishly say, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Um, but the, it's just such a draw to use the social media as a shortcut rather than being willing to be surprised, rather than being willing to actually meet someone who thinks and lives very differently than you do and you give them a chance to say who they are rather than using the social media. Well, um, social media, it's funny because you, you're talking about this. I've been looking up a lot of the stuff you've just been talking about on a computer. Uh, okay. and, and, uh, but it's interesting. Part of it is to do really dorky things. Like I was, I was reading the literal etymology of memento mori, which is interesting because on one hand, um, both of the words. So it's interesting that something that's about death and that like is going to happen, but like, you know, that we should call it to mind in the Latin. It's very much a future thing. Like you need to keep being mindful and remembering that you are currently dying. Like that, you know, mori is um, a present infinitive but in English, mm -hmm. it is almost consistently rendered, remember you will die or remember your death, which is interesting because it's you're supposed to call to mind something, like remember is usually about the past, remember a future thing, that you will die. And I, mm -hmm. it seems to me that that's very emblematic of what cross you know, cross-pollination of, of fields that you're bringing up make us do that remembering is not just like recalling recalling is to make sure that a fact shows up uh it, it's to to think about our you know our minds like a computer can i recall something that i already know whether it's a past event or something that i've like you said learned um through some sort of other way remembering seems to be an act all its own that in a way has a present and future outlook even if it involves the past and that we can, so to speak, remember things that we didn't even really participate in. Um, and we can also seemingly, in a strange way, remember, at least metaphorically, stuff that will happen. I need to remember that I will die. Um, and that's why I thought it was interesting that you brought up death comes to the banquet table. 
Um, because this this reminds me of something. So I'm guessing you saw this when you lived in New Orleans because it's at the New Orleans Museum of Art, right? Um, I did, yes, yes. And it, it makes an absolute um, impression when you see it in person. And so, that's great. and that's one of the things I think is interesting about like people should get to know, uh, you know, their local art museum. So here in Des Moines, we're very lucky that um, – we have uh, uh, multiple Tanner paintings. He has a very famous um, uh, enunciation. But we have yes. Christ walking on water and then Mary teaching Christ to read. And then I'm I'm honestly blanking on the third one. But those two are some of my favorite paintings. And I'll just be blown away that there's people here that don't know that they have this like for free i'm back in tulsa in oklahoma we somehow ended up with the little shepherdess by Bergago, which is one of the most famous paintings it's all over places but what i'm getting at that is it's interesting right how it's remembering is not just like oh well we have this painting or oh they painted an event so that it stays in mind there's something to well, that's yours, and to remember it, you physically walk down there, and even if you move, so, you know, I'm not in Oklahoma anymore, you're not in New Orleans anymore, but that impression that that physically made because it was there and you could go see it, that's the sort of intersection of all these things that make memory and the sort of cultural uh, power of poetry and, and, and art span multiple medium. Um, it, you know, I, I, I'm not going to like even go towards the temptation of talking about the digital media because I talk about it so much in other places. But that's what starts to be interesting is media, of course, is never just a tool. It's an extension of who we are. And to get students to recognize that and then see how that would change their ability to see things like um, social science or medicine, like we're saying, that memory is much more than just recall and how is it that the good life necessitates us being good practitioners of the activity of memory and remembering and to me that's what comes across in so much of what your work does angel yeah i think that's right though um and i I like your reflections on you know looking at the the latin etymology remember that you're in the process of dying, you know, that this is, this is going to be your future. And so how do you live well in light of that? And this brings to mind another short story, um, Leaf by Niggle. Oh, yeah. And uh, Leaf by one Nig- of Tolkien's best. Yeah, I'm so here. You keep bringing up all the hits. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Leaf by Niggle by Tolkien um, is very powerful on this idea of, of memento mori. Um, and just what does it mean to live in a way that you remember you're in the process of dying and that there is a greater vision for your life um, and living in light of that? It's, so that's another one that I very much recommend to listeners on these themes. Well, Angel, we only have about a minute and a half, which is the, 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 the good problem to have is when you're having a wonderful conversation with someone, it goes way too fast. Uh, one more time, I want to remind people that you are uh, the research fellow for the Center for Human Flourishing at Mercy College. We're very happy and proud to have you be associated with us in that way. And that anyone who hears this and is excited about the themes should know September 14th and 15th, we've got details to work out about timing and when. But if they keep that in mind, September 14th and 15th in 2023, you will be here in Des Moines talking exactly about those things. With the minute left, um, do you mind telling people some of the websites or places they could go to find some of this great work uh, that you're doing, especially the public-facing work? Oh, the work that I'm doing. So I I think um, my website, angelparam.com, is one place that you can go to find links to the work that I'm doing. Um, And I do send out periodically a newsletter um, that you can sign up for at that site. And um, I say also maybe the website for Nyansa Classical Community, and that's a, a hand, you know, a mouthful. So <laughs> it is um, N is a Nancy Y A N is a Nancy S A Nyansa Classical Community dot org. Um, so there you'll also see uh, the work that I've been doing in the community. And then finally, um, if you're interested in the book that just came out, 
on the Black intellectual tradition. Um, that you can find at, just trying to find the actual website. You can find that at Classical Academic Press, the Black intellectual tradition, which just came out last year. Yeah, and uh, a high recommendation f- on my end for that one, especially with issues, as you hinted at, that sometimes people get this idea that the classical education is for a narrow field of people, whether that be race or class. Your book explodes this idea about the wide-ranging way in which the classical tradition has animated not only, of course, people across the globe, but particularly um, with the black intellectual tradition in America. And uh, it's just a very wonderfully written book, a fun book, but also deeply um, telling about, I, I think, uh, an entire history that we often miss out on. I can't recommend it enough for people. Angel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real blessing to have you. Thanks so much, Bone. I look forward to being there with you all in September. Absolutely. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from John Leonetti, EOS Implementer, the entrepreneurial operating system, helping businesses and organizations clarify, simplify, and achieve their vision. John.Leonetti at EOSWorldwide.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory. Caldwell Parish offers services that are unique to the individual while following the Catholic funeral rites. Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory, Des Moines' only Catholic-owned and operated funeral home. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference, July 27th through the 29th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dale Alquist, Bishop Robert Barron, Christopher Check, and an all-star lineup of speakers celebrate the 100th anniversary of Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi. Three days of intellectual stimulation, spiritual edification, fellowship, and fun. Learn more about the conference and register at Chesterton.org. Chesterton.org. A message from the Society of G.K. Chesterton and Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Knights of Columbus, Borman, and Pfeiffer Agency. Serving the Catholic families in Iowa, the Knights of Columbus is a fraternal benefit society providing financial security to members and their families. Specializing in life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability income insurance, and retirement annuities. You can reach Knights of Columbus field agent Gregory Waddle at 563-689-6801. That's 563-689-6801. Thank you and God bless. Iowa Catholic Radio would like to thank our business partner, Dino Storage, 2725 2nd Avenue in Des Moines, offering monthly rentals, indoor climate-controlled storage, and package delivery to your unit. Learn more at dinostorage.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by CTO. Your support has helped thousands of students attend our Catholic schools. CTOiowa.org. At CTO, the bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Bud, look, let's let's cut to the chase. We we have a little less time than usual because yeah. we had such a good conversation with Angel Angel uh, Adams Parham, uh, who is the fellow for the Center for Human Flourishing. You can go to mchs.edu slash flourish to find out more about her but a great way uh, to end the show. Well, I'm tempted, Bo, with the shorter time frame for the outro to uh, to do the voice that they do at the end of like um, commercials about medicine. Oh yeah, or the like, micro machine like one. I guess that <laughs> dates me really bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go at a leisurely pace. I know <laughs> we're up against the clock, but if you do want to join our prayer life here at Iowa Catholic Radio, you can do so. We pray the Rosary on air at six in the morning and ten a.m. Later in the afternoon at 2.55 p.m., the Chaplet of D- Divine Mercy. And you can use the Iowa Catholic Radio app anytime, anywhere to pray the rosary. And one more time, folks, if you want to catch up with what we're doing at the Center for Human Flourishing, but also have connection with um, uh, Angel and when she makes it to town, you can do that at mchs.edu slash flourish. Or if you found uh, what she was talking about compelling, just put in Angel Adams Parham, P-A-R-H-A-M. She has a website that links to all of her great stuff. Speaking of websites that link to great stuff, you can go to iowacatholicradio.com. Click on events and see what we are doing in and around uh, the Diocese of Des Moines and uh, south, southern and central Iowa. So July 14th, we have in West Des Moines, 
uh, around noon, at, uh, not around, at noon, <laughs> St. Francis of Assisi, the Man Up West Power Lunch. Focus missionaries Colin Flattery, Eric, Jans, and Matthew Prendergrass are going to be talking about their time with Focus. Lunch uh, provided by Chick-fil-A, or you're welcome to bring your own. July 15th at the Community Choice Credit Union Convention Center Ballroom. Walker Hayes presented by Fairway to benefit the Iowa Catholic Radio Foundation with special guest George Burge and local favorite Josh Sinclair. Uh, July 19th in the Tea Room, Core Night with Dr. John Bishop, whose topic is your job in the Trinity, Why Work is Holy, St. Pius the uh, St. Pius the 10th on July 22nd, 8th Annual Ignatian Treat with Amy Hoover. Finally, July 27th through 29th, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference. These are all things that if you go to iowacatholicradio.com and click on events, you can see. Always remember that this is a ministry that's beyond the people on air, behind the boards, or behind... Uh, the desks. It's your ministry as well. Your time through uh, volunteering, your prayers make it run. But also, we have to be honest, it is also your treasure. If you prayerfully can think about donating to Iowa Catholic Radio, you can do so on iowacatholicradio.com or calling 515-223-1150. Thank you for your continued support of what we do. Bud, great conversation. Looking forward to next week. I think you maybe just canonized St. Pi- like Pius the Ninth on air. Well, you heard it here <laughs> first, folks. <laughs> no. I'm trying my best. This is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, family, city, state, nation, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the Uncommon Good. We'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Helping you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Iowa Catholic Radio. The best days ever are at the Iowa State Fair, August 10th to the 20th with Iowa Catholic Radio. On the west side of the Annabelle Riley stage every day of the fair. Iowa Catholic Radio also has your opportunity to see Forking and Country. We are for King and Country. With special guest, We the Kingdom. the block with jesse mccarthy jeff dunham a still not canceled tour or lindsey sterling with special guests walk off the earth text fair to 515-223-1150 that's f-a-i-r to 515-223-1150 for your chance to win your choice of tickets learn more about the entertainment this year at iowastatefair.org and iowa catholic radio will see you at the 2023 iowa state fair for the best days ever text fair to 515-223-1150 for your chance to win from iowa Catholic Radio. Support for programming comes from Klein Electric, a local family-oriented electrical contractor, a 100% employee-owned company with branches across the Midwest to provide comprehensive electrical services. Klein Electric is able to help with any residential and commercial project. Learn more at kleinelectric.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from CTO. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Hi, this is Trent Horn from Catholic Answers. Have you ever told someone you're pro-life and they sarcastically asked, how many children have you adopted? Here's how I often respond. Let's say I haven't adopted children. Let's go further and say, I don't even like children. How does my bad attitude show it should be legal to dismember human beings in the womb? With this approach, the focus comes off you and I and goes back to the one question that matters most. What are the unborn? Just as slavery wasn't moral when few whites employed blacks, abortion is not moral even if few people adopt children endangered by abortion. However, most couples wait years to adopt newborns. The problem is not too few caring adults, it's too few children being given a chance to live. This has been Trent Horn with the Catholic Answers Pro-Life Minute. For my free booklet that will make you better at defending human life, visit whywearepro-life.com. 
Throughout history, our Lord has shown us that He is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. Experience these wonders for yourself as Iowa Catholic Radio presents the Vatican International Exhibition, Eucharistic Miracles of the World, at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Cedar Rapids, now through July 19th. Learn more about how you can bring this beautiful panel display to your parish, school, or faith-based organization by calling 515-223-1150 or visit iowacatholicradio.com, connecting listeners to Christ. Thank you to our business partner, McDonald Imaging Solutions. Family-owned, Marty and his son, Caleb McDonald, offered branded corporate apparel, logoed promotional products, marketing solutions, and printed items. Learn more at McDonaldImagingSolutions.com. Iowa Catholic Radio welcomes the 42nd Annual Chesterton Conference July 27th through the 29th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dale Alquist, Bishop Robert Barron, Christopher Check, and an all-star lineup of speakers celebrate the 100th anniversary of Chesterton's book on St. Francis of Assisi. Three days of intellectual stimulation, spiritual edification, fellowship, and fun. Learn more about the conference and register at Chesterton.org. Chesterton.org. A message from the Society of G.K. Chesterton and Iowa Catholic Radio. Listen to Iowa Catholic Radio anywhere. Download the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Listener supported Iowa Catholic Radio, 1150 AM KWKY, Des Moines, 94.5 FM K233BT, Des Moines, 88.5 FM KIHS, Adele, online anytime.